we're going to perform some transformative surgery on a rather nice guitar, hand-built. This is the kind of job that requires a little bit of philosophical introspection before proceeding, though. The patient is an arch top that was inspired by John D'Angelico, who was one of the most important figures in the development of that instrument. He has one of those quintessential New York Italian stories from the early 20th century. He was born in Manhattan, trained as a violin maker with his uncle, uh, at a certain point decided that he didn't want to deal with um, sort of running that business for his uncle, and he struck out on his own in the 1930s, decided to build archtop guitars for discerning players. He took the Gibson design, the L5 at that time, and he sort of pushed it with um, Art Deco motifs and styling. And the kind of attention to detail a good violin shop instills in someone. His output was pretty extraordinary for a one-person shop. He was making about 35 instruments a year, and even with one or two assistants, that's a lot when you're dealing with arch tops. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes into these that isn't there on a flat top. There's a whole bunch of carving, and it's just a long process. One of his later assistants turned out to be Jimmy DeQuisto, who might be one of the most revered arch top makers of all time. So, John D'Angelico's influence is huge, far-reaching, long-lasting, and this is in his vein, we'll call it that. The owner of this guitar had it made for him by a small shop in the 90s, which I don't believe is building anymore. Nice guitar, who made it, bro? It's from the Bros Grimm, bro. Bro, do they even bro anymore, bro? No, bro. It's Grimm, bro. It's essentially a copy of an 18-inch New Yorker. Build quality is pretty good. Nice material. You see something like this and it's like, yeah, okay, sure. But, you know, it's not that easy making a truss rod cavity if you don't have the special, sort of like a counterbore bit that Gibson used that keyed off of the truss rod path and, you know, cuts a beautiful cylindrical bore. But, you know, it functions. It's usually covered up. It was originally fitted with a pick guard mounted pickup. And the owner can't get along with that. It just wasn't working for him. It's not the sound that he wants. And he's decided to convert this to a full on electric guitar with soundboard mounted pickups. It's got a set of P90s. That's a proposition that will set some people's teeth on edge, is there is a sort of purest sensibility that runs through a portion of the arch top market that wants this kind of guitar to be appreciated first and foremost as an acoustic instrument. Uh, guys like Bob Benedetto and the aforementioned Jimmy DeQuisto, they went out of their way to make it work as an acoustic and the amplification was sort of a discrete element from that. It, it's not quite an afterthought, but they certainly didn't want to make concessions about the acoustic sound. So that's why we get a lot of pickups and controls on the pick guard or mounted to the end of the neck and they tried really hard not to put controls through the soundboard figuring that that was going to ruin the sound. Still, you know, there are a lot of great jazz guitars out there with soundboard mounted pickups and this is owned by the person who commissioned it. It was his project from the get-go and I guess he gets to direct the direction in which it goes. It's also unlikely that this is going to become a collectible, as it's not from a well-known maker. Uh, it may actually find its highest purpose as an electric. Who knows? So I'm going to don the butcher's apron, and I'm going to cut holes in this thing. But they'll be neat holes, and I'll try to be sensible about it. You know, there are some structural considerations to take into account when we do something like this. We don't want to undermine the soundboard stiffness and cause it to collapse. Ironically, most hand-carved solid wood arch tops have thicknesses in them that are much greater than the heat laminated plywood you'd find in a Gibson. Um, they might not be as susceptible to collapsing, actually. But if you're going to cut holes, you've got to you know, introduce some added bracing to compensate for the fact that you're cutting holes. So we have some parts that came along with it. It's this rather beautiful plated D'Angelico tailpiece. There's the original pickguard. Looking at it, uh, some of the lines are delaminating. I don't know. 
He says I can make use of it um, if it can work, but I think given the mounting screw holes in it and mostly the cutout position for the pickup, it's probably not going to work with the P90 mount. Um, I'm not going to line up. Plus there's also the hole for the pot. We have to do something about that. I don't know. He also made a tracing of another guard from his collection uh, off one of his favorite Guild guitars. We might work with that instead. There's some electronics. He says that he prefers Alpha Pots to CTS because they feel better to him. This harness has a couple of Alphas push-pulls, but, you know, I'm not excited about putting those in if I'm not going to use the piggyback function. And these other ones are CTS. The date of which is December of 2012. So, you know, I think we'll probably end up using new components. It'll be faster and more reliable and it'll actually be alpha pots. There's also a switch, which looks like a good switch craft. And it's gold, which is nice and matching. Uh, could be useful. Assuming I can find the nut that goes with it. People often disassemble guitars thinking that the parts will be useful, but if you don't keep that nut, this thing's going in the garbage. Because this is not a hardware store item. It's not let's you can't go out to Home Depot and buy that particular nut. There aren't that many in the world. Sometimes it feels like there's only like seven and they get switched around from guitar to guitar. So we'll see if I can find one of those in the spare parts. I don't know. And for pickups, got a brand new set of hand wounds from Peg City Pickups. What up, Winnipeg? I have to make a routing template to cut holes. So I'll measure these pretty carefully and make sure they're similar to each other. And uh, glue that up. Okay, here's my template. Goes in there. You see that it's cut back significantly on the side that's towards the neck so that it'll fit over top of the fingerboard. This lacquer is in reasonably good condition. There are a few checks here and there. And we've got some painter's tape on here. I'm a little bit wary about leaving this stuff on for any length of time. Um, because even though it's painter's tape, it can pull up finish if you're not careful. This seems to be coming off okay. There's also indents and a slight discoloration uh, around the position of the bridge. I'm going to get rid of this anyway. Make my own measurements to make sure this was positioned in the correct place to begin with um, before I do measurements and figure out where I want this pickup. Okay, so we want the neck pickup pretty close to the end of the fingerboard here. And in terms of the bridge positioning, well you can put it anywhere really. There is some lore out there about um, having the bridge pickup in a magical location that will function with the harmonics of the string to give you the purest ultimate tone. Uh, to which I say, as soon as you fret the guitar, you have changed the string length, thereby ruining the magic. Usually, the closer to the bridge, the more bright or strident you get. Farther away, uh, slightly more warm character. However, um, there is something to the idea of having two pickups on a guitar. The neck pickup can change the um, magnetic sort of signature that's going on because they're holding on to the string slightly with its force, even when it's not engaged. So there is something about guitars with one single pickup. They can sound a little more open, a little more free, but most people want two pickups because of the usable um, combination of tones that they provide. So, you know, unless you you really love the LP Junior or something, you know, most people want the second pickup. I would normally leave this approximately half inch, maybe five eighths of an inch from the front edge of the bridge. It's kind of where I think it looks right and it seems to function just fine for me. Okay, so I'm going to hold a straight edge up against the side of the neck here and project that onto the body, um, hoping to derive the center line of the neck so we can keep the pickup centered on it. Uh, you could go ahead and assume that that's also the center line on the body. However, in some cases you would be quite wrong and you will have your pickups very far from where you'd want them. 
under the strings. And in this case, this neck is reasonably straight. There is a bit of a bumpy thing that happens around the body joint. Um, I got good contact most of the way along. So I'm just going to mark that. It's hard on an arch top, of course, because of the undulating quality of the guitar. But this should give us something to work from. It should be pretty close. Yeah, and in this case it seems like the center lines are slightly off. Yeah, it actually moves. It's pretty close to right on at the end of the body, but up here it's almost like 3 seconds of an inch, um, 2.3 millimeters from where I would expect it to be. Okay, with this marked out, the next step is of course to make recesses, which have to be um, pretty careful in terms of both size and positioning. However, there's an issue with this kind of guitar. It's an arch top. This template is flat on the bottom, and it wants to rock slightly. Now I could spend a very long time putting sandpaper on here, scrubbing it back and forth, and making the bottom of the template um, an exact match with this radius, and do that twice because these are different locations and different radii. Um, however, I have a different way of doing it that's maybe not quite as exacting, but it'll get the job done. Because as I say, you're not going to see this hole. It's just got to be sort of in the ballpark in terms of size. I'm going to use epoxy putty on the bottom here and stick it directly to the top. Wait for that to set up and then it's going to be in the right spot. You've seen me in the past use just a regular super glue for flat top instruments. And this is basically the same thing. Again, if it cants a little in one direction or the other, not a big deal. I mean, I have these guidelines that will keep me um, centered and in the ballpark. Epoxy putty has the hardener included in the center, and we just mix that up thoroughly. Uh, I got about two minutes before this stuff gets hard once it's been mixed. So you can't dawdle. you got to really work it fast and get it mixed up and in position. I'm going to use a fairly generous glob on both sides, I'm trying to keep away from the edge that the router is going to uh, contact. And find the location again. Make sure the center lines match up. Bear down a bit. And let that cure for about 10 minutes. To do the excavating, I'll be using what's known as a hinge mortising bit. The router is unplugged. My fingers are relatively safe. This is a bearing guided bit. It's got a fairly short length of cutting edge. It's about 5 eighths of an inch long. And uh, it plunges well because the center has been relieved. It's been cut out. so it, it goes in without binding. And um, yeah, I'll do it in successive passes, even though this is only about a quarter inch deep. I want to be fairly gentle, because I am routing spruce, and spruce can be kind of tricky. To get a tighter radius in the corners, I'll use this uh, 3 8 inch bearing guided bit from Stuart McDonald. See some inconsistency in the top thickness. Well, that's not ideal. I think I might end up loading the harness through the neck cavity rather than the bridge. I don't want to take any more strength out of the brace than I absolutely have to. So I've um, put a little bit of ink on the um, pole pieces of the pickup and made some marks. I'll just 
this cut on either side here. And uh, I will likely add some extra bracing in this area, just in case. Yeah, I think I might just get away with it. For this area up here around the neck pickup, I'm going to borrow a technique from Fred Carlson and his um, pretty innovative bracing structures, which he actually builds in place uh, from multiple ply. In his case, they're often sort of put together log cabin style. They interlock. I won't need that. But uh, what's nice is these are about a hundred thousandths thick. It's about 2.4 millimeters. So they're flexible enough that I can um, glue them in place and they'll conform to the arch of the top. But when I've got three of them together, they're going to end up about 300 thousandths thick, which uh, should add some needed rigidity in this area. It's sandpaper on a block. Just going to clean up the surface, make sure it's flat. One of the more awkward clamping situations I've gotten myself into recently. These little things are kind of important. They resist the folding force that happens when you cut a big hole through a guitar top. Now take out the old jack. It's a rather stout piece of wire. Save the jack. Oh, and this is what I mean when I say that drilling a half inch hole, uh, it's too wide for the barrel of these jacks. You can just see just how deformed this washer is. It's cupped inwards, and if we look at the hole in the end of the body, I suspect we will find that that has kind of mashed inwards as well. Yeah, it's almost like it's been countersunk. So, yeah, it's better to have something like 12 millimeters. Yes, this hole is right where the lower screw has to go. So we'll put a plug in there. It's a half inch plug cutter. I'm using Spanish cedar so the shop smells nice. Inexpensive vacuum wand extender. Let's think about some electronics for this thing. The owner has decided to take the minimalist approach. He just wants master volume, master tone, and a selector switch. Essentially a Telecaster setup, which is a reasonable request. Uh, won't be too much to fool with or get bogged down in. Uh, what's the reason for having independent volumes and tones like you see on most Gibsons? Well, if you have pickups of differing outputs, an imbalanced situation where one is very much louder than the other, it can be nice to control for that. So that if you're one of these people who switch from pickup to pickup frequently while you're playing, you won't have to keep fooling with the volume all the time. Or if you play rhythm for part of a song and then want to, you want to get a bit of a boost for a solo, it's all set up for you if you switch pickups. Um, still, a lot of that can also be controlled with, say, a clean boost foot pedal on the floor too, if you need it. Because this guitar has an X brace in it, rather than the parallel bracing you find in most Gibsons, there is less room to play with for the positioning of the controls. Also, the F hole is fairly close to the edge of the body. Uh, oftentimes they're more towards the center line. And Gibsons, of course, will usually have two knobs on either side of the F hole. That would be pretty cramped in this case. I mean, I think you could do it, but the knobs would be right up next to the binding, which might look a little weird. So I think we'll keep to this side of the hole, and also maybe leave a little bit of room in event that, you know, somewhere down the line someone wants to put more controls in it. We'll put the selector switch up here in the upper bout on the cutaway horn, where 
you expect to find it in 1950s L5s, for instance. We need to put a hole in the side as well for a jack, and the player wasn't quite ready to commit to a location when he dropped it off, so I sent him a picture last night with these possible placements, and he's decided to go with what I would consider the standard spot for a jack. Some people have definite preferences about that, you know. Some like to thread the cord up through their strap, for instance, or you know, if they have a wireless transmitter, you know, they want it higher up on the body. But this is pretty standard. This is where you expect to find it. Doggone if I didn't get that right there within half a millimeter by eye. We'll use a small bit and work up to the right size. Yeah, and this is the kind of thing I tend to finish off with a reamer. I took the tracing from his guild pick guard and transferred it using some carbon paper. I'm using manila folder material for templates recently because I got a big box of them on sale. I plan to put a binding on the pick guard, so I'm actually going to reduce its size slightly, or at least at this point I thought I was. Um, so I'm taking a compass and scribing a line 1.5 millimeters in from the edge, which I can recut. Looking at this now, I'm thinking to myself, this is a big guitar. It's a full 18 inches. And I think this guard could actually be bigger. So I'm just going to leave the template the same size it is now and bind around it, which will increase it by a millimeter and a half or so. There's still enough room down where the bridge sits. And uh, I think it'll be fine. There's one little area I'm not convinced about in terms of shape. And that's how it interacts with this section of the cutaway. It kind of swoops in a different area. And I kind of want this to come in like that. And kind of mimic the shape a bit more. I want to plot the location of the lower arm of the X-brace there. So I've got a steel rule I measure in from the inside and um, transfer that to the outside. Because, you know, I don't want to, like drill a hole for a potentiometer right on top of it or something ridiculous. And I'll figure out the position and the location of the controls. Yeah, I think that feels good. Thinking about the jack, I think, rather than the switchcraft, I'm actually going to go with the import because of the length of barrel. Checking out the top thickness here, uh, I think I can get the import to go through with enough extra for the nut. But the switchcraft, no, I'm several millimeters short. This has got a good positive feel to it. And yeah, you do want to sort of visually center things. That is 105. That is 52 and a half there. And just carve the little depth gauge. It looks like we have about eight millimeters depth there. And the post on here, if we go right from the base plate, no washer or anything, is nine millimeters. One millimeter to spare? That's like not enough to get a full thread on here. Ideally, the thickness we're looking for is approximately six millimeters. So I'm going to have to come up with some sort of counter bore to see if I can take some material off the back side of this. This is the kind of thing that, you know, you think about, well, I'll just put a switch there. Uh-uh, it ain't so easy. It's never that easy. I thought about it for some time and came up with this idea. This is what's known as a pen mill. It's used by wood turners to true up the faces on wood blanks for making pens and to keep the face perpendicular to a hole that's been drilled down the center of the blank. Uh, basically a counter bore. And this has a pilot with a cutter, which is about 25 millimeters in diameter, about an inch wide, which seems just about right to me. And uh, I'm going to try and position it with hemostats. I, I think there's just enough room for me to get in through the hole for the neck pickup. If not, I'm going to have to modify it by drilling a hole through the shaft through which I can string a fishing line and pull it up into position. Um, I'll run my drill in reverse to account for the fact that this has got counterclockwise facing uh, 
edges. And um, sort of, it'll be sort of like the device I use to cut plug holes in damaged bridge plates. I ground a little flat for the set screw to bite into. It's tricky to judge the length I should uh, make this thing. Um, this is pretty close to the total depth of the inside of the instrument that I'm working on now. However, there might be other occasions where this could come in handy. I'm thinking of um, Harmony end blocks that can sometimes be almost an inch and a half in length. Um, it would be nice to be able to countersink for jacks in those. However, I can always get myself another piece of rod, I guess. I want it to be a good snug fit. Um, so it's acting like its own bushing and it's not going to wobble around too much. I figure if I put this piece of tape on here, even with the soundboard, uh, it'll act as a guideline for me. And I'll be able to tell when I've come up about three millimeters. Okay, I'm running the drill in reverse, obviously. This is liable to take some time because I can't apply very much force as I'm pulling up and I don't want it to slip up the rod. Plus it's a rather large diameter. So anytime we're making a pick guard like this where we expect to bind it with a separate piece of binding, um, the sanded surface is not good enough. It's just, it's not usually perpendicular enough to the faces. So you're basically forced to make a template every time and do it with a router. It's the most accurate way and you get the best results. I may never need this particular template again, but without it this job becomes misery. To replace the missing truss rod cover, the owner made another tracing of a distinctive guild design that's shaped kind of like a shield. Sometimes these jobs feel more like jewelry making. Rather than try and stick these pieces of plastic together with acetone, which I've done in the past with eh, okay success, I've decided to go with JB Weld's Plastic Bonder. This is an adhesive. It's black in color, but uh, on my test piece, hardly noticeable. And um, yeah, it has a 15 minute open time, and I think it will probably help me uh, do a neater job. So it's just a regular, like a two part epoxy designed specifically for plastics. Now, what I have done is slightly roughed up the edge with uh, the point of my scalpel blade making little striations here to give this something to key on and uh, make a really good bond. This guard is made out of acrylic. It's the material that Stuart McDonald sells. Um, they sell it in either 2mm or 3mm thicknesses. I've gone with the 2mm simply because the acrylic is stiffer than the equivalent uh, celluloid and um, when you're dealing with a tortoise shell pattern, I find the thicker stuff is so dark you might as well use black. Like you don't really see the tortoise when it's on the guitar. So this stuff at least uh, there's some pattern there. It's a 50-50 ratio. 15 minute open time becomes hard after half an hour. I'm going to let it set overnight before I do any cleanup or scraping. I still have a protective plastic facing on both sides of the pickguard. The binding has been cut just slightly oversize, just over three millimeters, three and a half millimeters. Made up the wiring harness. For F-hole guitars, the object is to emphasize keeping things straight and compact and, if possible, build in some strain relief. Here I'm using a dab of super glue to hold the spiked washers in place on the pots. Positioning the components inside the guitar, in this case, involves wrapping fishing line around the tops of them and uh, 
pulling and cajoling as well as you can. It takes some patience. I've learned over time that it pays to make the connections for the pickups accessible through one of the openings so that in the event that someone wants to switch them later on, you don't have to pull out the entire harness again. You can just desolder them there, put the new pickups on, and um, save yourself half a day. I need to trim the oversized binding flush with the pick guard. So I can do that with deft maneuvers with a hand plane, followed by hand scraping with a razor blade. Here's a satisfying job. It won't look like that for long, but it's nice. I put a couple of strings through the tailpiece and uh, temporarily put them on the guitar so that I could mark its position for drilling the mounting screws. Here's where I discovered the holes in the tailpiece are too small for the screws that were supplied. I had to bore those out. It's time to mark the screw positions for the pickup covers, just measuring between them to make sure they're parallel. Once those are in place, I can mark their positions on the pick guard for the cutouts. I then mark the position for some holes to be drilled, so the corners will be radiused. I'll use a tiny little back saw to cut the straight portions, followed up by the jeweler's saw. These frets are, well, they kind of are what they are. I can tell that effort wasn't made to remove the little piece of material that's left under the cutout that goes over the binding. Um, also, I think the binding was probably rounded over slightly before they were installed, which is just, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, so I'm just going to clean these up as best I can. Polishing, polishing, polishing. Okay, I think we're going to call it. There is one more operation to do on this, and that is the bridge pickup is a little bit low, which is not uncommon for dog ear P90s. Thousands of them left the factory a little bit low. Uh, but I could get about a sixteenth of an inch closer to the strings and be happy. So I will end up making or purchasing a riser uh, for that pickup. Um, other than that, I like the way it turned out. Um, happy with the pick guard. I like that new adhesive. There's probably going to be someone who complains that I didn't bind this in multi-line purfling. Um, I think the simplicity is a breath of fresh air. There's enough multi-line purfling all around the guitar. And uh, yeah, it's still actually quite loud and functional as an unamplified arch top. <laughs> Hum cancelling. Basically makes them into a big humbucker.